I'm Sari Kimball, and I've done just about everything in the food industry. I have helped hundreds of packaged food business entrepreneurs, and now I want to help you make your delicious dream a reality. Whether you want to be successful at farmer's markets, online, or wholesale onto store shelves, food business success is your secret ingredient. I will show you how to avoid an expensive hobby and instead run a profitable food business. Now let's jump in. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. This is a really special one for me. I get to interview longtime friend, mentor, um, woman I really admire and just an all-around badass. I get to talk with Tanya Ellis. And Tanya is a natural foods retailer and enthusiast for over 30 years with 15 years in grocery store leadership. Um, She's also a plant-based eater and a small business owner uh, as a side hustle. I forgot about that. (laughs) I love it that you're an entrepreneur (laughs) as well. So welcome, Tanya. I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So um, Tanya and I go way back. Uh, She was uh, the associate store team leader when I was at Whole Foods Market. And uh, now you are the store leader, um, or what's the right title for you at Lucky's Market? At Lucky's, we call it a store director. Store director. Great. Um, And you have been in the grocery industry for a long time. You want to just give us a little quick timeline of your (laughs) your, uh, journey? Absolutely. Uh, my journey is, uh, you know, long like everybody's, but I, when I graduated from college in Missouri, I graduated from Mizzou um, in the early 90s, and I had met my husband. He was my boyfriend then, and he had two years still left, so I quit my job as a bartender and pizza hustler and got a job at a little local natural food store and never looked back man i started working in natural foods in a tiny shop in missouri and then um my husband and i ended up uh, moving to colorado when we had yet to get married just for the outdoor life and when we moved here i got a job at um wild oats so it was columned by market and then wild oats oh and then gosh. three weeks later I got a job at alfalfa's and uh then I stayed at Alfalfa's until Whole Foods opened in town, and then I left Alfalfa's to open Whole Foods, and then stayed with Whole Foods for 14 years and left Whole Foods to open Lucky's. So it's been a really fun journey, just learning the industry from a tiny, tiny store to a a, a big, high-volume store, and now I'm back in the middle. So it's a fun path, and I think just the education, you, you, I couldn't look back. Like Once you learn something about natural foods and um, how they benefit your, you personally, as well as the environment and, um, you know, the people around you, uh, is a hard subject to drop. Yeah. And you started in whole body. Is that where you started? I know at whole foods, you were in whole body. Yeah, I think, well, uh, working in a tiny store, you work everywhere, but sure. I got, um, you know, I was doing buying for dairy and buying for supplements all at <laughs> once in a tiny store. Um, as well as, you know, cashiering and whatnot. But, um, you know, when I moved to Colorado, I was with my supplements knowledge. I just ended up um, as an assistant in a supplements department and then running a supplements department for 15 years. So, um, yeah, I opened Whole Foods as the whole body team leader there. Mm -hmm. Um, And then so that's my home base for sure. I, I still have a passion for supplements. And my husband is a you know, sales rep for a supplement company. So the education continues in our house. Like I can't, I can't stay away from the supplements and body care category. (laughs) Well, um, so you're coming from your uh, office at at Lucky's Market and um, you would describe Lucky's as like a, what would you describe as far as like a size? Is it a, I mean, it's, it used to be regional. It was super local and regional. How do you describe it to people? Uh, I, I, I when I describe it to people, I say it's just a weird corner market. Like we have two stores, so it allows us the freedom to be weird and embrace the um, fun part about grocery retail. We get to build our own sets. We get to build our own planograms. We get to talk to local vendors all the time and decide um, one-on-one what's best for our customers on this corner market. Um, 
we're pretty niche. So I think a lot of stores in town, um, the bigger a store gets typically, the more streamlined their operations are. And so for us to find our way, we found that we carry the odds and ends um, of what other stores don't carry um, that keep people coming into our store, but we still carry all the basics as well in most categories. So right. um, people can do a full shop at our store. Yeah, but I think we're amazing. mid-sized, you know, we're not, we're not a tiny, um, we're not as small as a co-op, we're not as big as Whole Foods, so we're right, right. there in the middle. So you're coming from your uh, store office, which I love, it's just got all the clipboards and all <laughs> the things and, and cold. <laughs> this is my office version. manager's office. So. Oh, <laughs> um, but I just, I want to ask the question, like, how are you? Like, how have you gotten through this. I mean, you have such an ability to remain calm under pressure. You have been such a good, you were always such a good example uh, when I worked with you of just like maintaining composure. But how are you doing? We are in March of 2022 after two years of this. I'm doing great. You know, it's been such a wonky three years for Lucky's. We opened three years ago. We turned three on March 6th. So we're newly three. We're toddling now. And we opened up and within, before our one year anniversary, our company went through bankruptcy. So we went from 39 stores to two stores. Um, and I feel, you know, so fortunate to, to work and be one of those two stores. And I got a lot of new skills. You know, I've never navigated leading a team through a bankruptcy. So that was new and exciting. Um, we emerged from bankruptcy um, a year later, right as COVID hit. So then it was a, a fun time and you just had to have a good sense of humor. It's like, do we not have toilet paper on the shelves because of we didn't pay a bill somewhere? Or do we not have toilet paper on the shelves because it's a pandemic? I'm not sure. Um, so again, walking through another new situation just created a, a new set of skills. And, and I don't know how to answer the question about, you know, how do you stay strong? I have a general tendency to wake up every morning and be like, all right, what's this day have for me? And watch each day unfold and um, really embrace the dynamic part of the grocery retail business. So you wouldn't do it for 30 years, 30 years if you didn't have a good sense of humor about um, what's coming at you every day. And if, if you have a expectation of how your day is going to go, you'll probably be really um, dissatisfied in the role. So you just got to embrace the roller coaster piece of it. And uh, the last three years is offered plenty of roller coasters. So um, I'm doing great. It's just been a really dynamic and crazy three years and um, it's helped me grow as a leader as well. Yeah. What is the Buddhist saying, right? Like suffering is in the chasm, the, the valley of like um, the reality of it and then what you hoped would be, right? Your expectations. So you, <laughs> you must do a good job. Right. It's just like, I, I think it's good to look forward, but you also have to just you know, I try not to hold any grudges or, you know, if there's a call out or there's an obstacle or there's a out of stock or it's, it's, it's not like, well, this happened because of this, this, and this. It's like, that's all great to do the, the post-mortem on something and not have it happen twice. But ultimately in the day, it's like, don't be angry or upset. Like, what are we going to do today and how are we going to go past that obstacle? And that's been um, just part of my constitution. And so I think it's helped me navigate my career as well. Yeah. So I, I, we ran into each other at Lucky's um, a couple months ago and it was so yeah. fun. You had some time to catch up. And, um, and so I asked you if you would be willing to come on the podcast, I think because, um, well, A, I think you're just such a great model of leadership and oh, thank such you. An amazing experience in the grocery industry. But, you know, uh, a Lucky's Market is a great example of a sort of local mid-size grocery retailer that is very open to taking on local products. And so I thought it'd be so helpful, you know, people listen from all over um, the country, even the world to, to this podcast. Um, but, you know, as an example, just to help guide um, people as they're starting on a journey going into wholesale, maybe give them some behind the scenes, <laughs> um, your perspective from things. But um, so maybe talk with us about kind of Lucky's Market um, view on local and how you guys uh, see that as important to your strategy. 
I mean, local did a, a huge component of our strategy because we have such um, a small company, you know, and, and uh, suppliers and new business owners get to talk to the buyers here at our store and talk to me one-on-one instead of having to go through um, the hoops of talking to an anonymous, um, you know, category manager or something from a bigger company. They just come in and say, this is what I'm making. This is what I'm doing. And uh, we can talk to them about how it would fit in our sets. Um, there's always a challenge within a store that it's a finite amount of space. So for every product that comes in, usually something gets kicked out. So um, it's a dynamic environment that um, some people, I think, who haven't worked in it don't understand that piece of it. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed with some small companies is they tend to, if they've been selling at a farmer's market, they're making what they need to make on the product, but then they want to sell it to a store at that, and we have to make money on a product as well. So it's understanding the difference between wholesale and retail um, and how that market works um, is sometimes an obstacle for a new business owner. Um, that we can help walk them through. But, uh, you know, I understand uh, I understand they need to make a profit, and I don't think they understand that they can't sell it to us for the same price, you know, um, at, that they sell it to their customer direct for, because otherwise if we make a margin on it to accommodate paying our rent and paying our team members, um, then we we won't be able to sell it at a too high of a price. So right. that's, that's an obstacle that I think some businesses um, haven't thought about yet fully. Uh, so it's so good to hear you say that because it's something I talk about over and over and over again. And you can just send people to me when they ask that question because we yeah, talk I about will. that That's first great. thing. Like, let's look at our cost of goods sold. We need price parity. You can't charge, you know, the wholesaler the same that you charge at the farmer's market. And how do we value engineer and get your price down? And we do that through efficiencies mm-hmm. and buying power and labor and all these things. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> like That's go, great. You go. have helped so many companies. I'm so proud of you, Sarah, of what oh. all the companies that you've escorted into retail. Um, it's a huge feather in your cap. You're doing a fantastic job navigating those conversations. And when people come to us who have gone through you, they're um, many times fully formed and ready to launch. So that's oh, awesome. Kudos I to you. I love that. Yeah, I do have a number of clients in, in Fort Collins or in Colorado. And I'm like, go. Like I prep them to go into your store. But yeah. <laughs> and it's good to hear that they're prepared. So that's awesome. So I agree. I think people need to understand that this is like real estate, right? And like these shelves are full, hopefully, right? They already have product assigned to them. And so we need to make a pitch um, to the retailer about why our product should be on the shelf and there needs to be a return on investment. This isn't just free space. But what are some of the do's and don'ts? I know you talk to buy or uh, to vendors, makers, but um, you also have a team of uh, grocery folks who talk with them too. But when somebody's ready to pitch to somebody like a Lucky's, what are some do's and don'ts? Uh, I, you know, I think the, I have more do's and don'ts. Most like, mostly it's reach out, you know, call the store, find out who the buyer is, try to get their email, contact them electronically. Um, stopping in unannounced sometimes will get you the shortest visit because our teams are busy. Um, we have load, we have order deadlines. There's all kinds of things that each of our department managers are, are, are you know, trying to stay on top of. So, um, Sending an e uh, email is usually the best way with an introduction about yourself and your product. Um, following up with, um, if they haven't gotten back to you, say, I'm going to send samples your way and go ahead and send a product to them with a sell sheet and your information, your business card. Um, and then just to keep following up on that, um, you know, whether at that point you can do a phone call. But getting product into the buyer's hands so that they can feel it and taste it um, as well as just that electronic contact versus the pop-in um, is or, or some just quick do's and don'ts. Um, and to know the market, you know, if you haven't visited the store or looked at, um, at, at the store, if, uh, we understand not everybody can stop in at least to understand, um, you know, go into your local natural foods market Look at the look at the category. Make sure that your product you you know what you're up against, so that you can make that pitch and answer those questions and not be caught off guard. 
Yeah. You really need to know your numbers, all your product information, have a barcode. I mean, your level of store, mm-hmm. we need to have a correct GS1 barcode. We need a sell sheet, all things that we do inside Food Business Success. Uh, but yeah. yeah, and you need to be prepared, like understanding your margins, understanding how you can differentiate yourself, right? I'm thinking of um, one client I know just pop, came in uh, recently and, you know, their, their beet burger, it's like, how do they position themselves as a different product among all of the other plant-based burgers out there, right? And especially because they're going right. to have a higher price point than as a local producer, there's just, to some extent, there's no way around it. So you got to convince you first, and then you have to be able to convince customers as well. Right. And we're not there to walk customers through everything. I mean, we have team members on the floor all the time, but um, that product has to be able to jump off the shelf to to the customers. And we help with local signage. We help with local vendor profiles to to make local items um, stand out as a better option or, you know, people can identify local in our store. Um, without having to ask a team member, like, which ones of these are local? But right. um, it's not the number one buying trait for a lot of consumers. It's, it could be a tiebreaker, but most um, shoppers are coming in and they want tasty food. They want um, food that they get have a good value for. So it might not be the, it doesn't have to be the cheapest thing on the shelf, but it, it needs to be competitive um, because if it's local and delicious, but twice as much as the products um, in the category, it won't sell um, or it will only sell to the, you know, the friends of the people who are excited to see it out in the, you know, out, out on a retail shelf. Uh, but then it usually sells once and not twice. And, um, you know, the name of uh, retail is uh, turns. You've got to keep turning this merchandise. We don't want to have a food museum. We want to have a dynamic, uh, we want to fill shelves and, and, and not be dusting products. So that's, that's not our favorite job. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna pull that quote. We're not here to have a few food museum. Awesome. Yeah, with all this awesome food that no one wants to buy twice. You're like, it, it's tasty, I swear, but um, yeah, sorry. It's, we've curated this great selection for you to look at. Right. <laughs> that's, that's not funny. our business. Yeah, and I think that's where, yeah, you need to understand what makes you differentially unique, what's gonna stand out, um, how you can be as competitive as possible, but if you, if you can't compete on price, how can you compete elsewhere? And I think your packaging has mm-hmm. to do so much more lifting for you. I always say like, you're not at a farmer's market where you can kind of talk to the consumer and tell them all the great things. Like your packaging really has to do that for you. Yeah, I think there's, um, you know, when we talk about the do's and don'ts again, you know, people who have only sold through the farmer's market Again, I'd encourage them to go into a grocery store and see how the grocery store um, or natural food stores packaging looks so that they know the, a different approach for retail. It's great to have a farmer's market um, side of your line and then still have a retail side of the line where maybe, um, let's go back to the beef burger. Maybe the burger is a little bit um, smaller, but it's, it will help it stay in line price-wise. Um, Mm -hmm. and the ones that you saw in farmer's market have a different package. It's more like right straight from your home kitchen to, you know, the consumer's kitchen, but, um, for the retail step in between, it really has to stand up. Um, literally the packaging has to stand up, (laughs) um, (laughs) as well as, um, like you said, it needs to be able to speak to the customer because you're not there hand selling it. And even a great demo, um, usually the after effects of a demo you know, it, it, you'll get great sales in the moment, but you can, you need to get people to buy it twice. And without you there talking to them about it, when they come to buy it the second time and they start to look at the category and your product sitting in the category, it has to still stand out and be a good value. Right. And I'll just note that your label also needs to be compliant and you as a grocery store, while you're not there to enforce it, (laughs) you are sort of assuming that their label is FDA compliant and they have all the components of that. So just, (laughs) you bet. I know we get phone calls sometimes about like, how, how do I get into your store? And it's like, well, do you, you know, they'll have like a personal Gmail and they don't have UPCs and they don't have insurance. They haven't yet had a company. They just had this you know, my friends love my salsa and I want to make it and sell it. They tell me I should get in there and you carry local things. It's like, yeah, well, first let's 
break your salsa out of your kitchen and, and open a business and, um, you know, get a separate checkbook for that. Let's, 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 let's get you started on the right foot. Cause, um, we don't want to sell cottage products, um, in yeah. a cottage way. We want to sell, you know, beautiful cottage like products, um, in a compliant way. You're exactly right. I love it. Oh, again, that's where you need to just join food business success. We will do all those things. Exactly. Um, you, I mean, and you have talked to so many people and, and walked them through that process. I imagine, um, the phone calls you get are even more interesting than some of the ones that I get, but, <laughs> Um, you know, it's like, what, what do I do? I have this, yeah, I have this great thing that I give to my neighbors. Um, how do I get on your shelves? You're like, okay, there's going to be a couple of different things. And even just the obstacle of getting insurance, you know, to get a million dollar liability insurance is an expense. So people have to decide if they're in or they're out because, um, it's something that you, as a making the jump from a cottage market to, um, becoming retail ready, really takes a an investment in um trusting the process and you have to know that it's it's you know you have to put some money on that front side to become compliant and that and you have to have the commitment personally that you're going to stick through and see if you can um ha- you know it, how many stores you can get in or what your sales will be and if it's going to be worth that expense and and you I know you Sarah you help people with that math and make sure like if you don't think you can sell enough units or you don't think you want to quit your day job or you're not at that point to put enough, that many hours into your side hustle, it might not be worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So they get on the shelf, which people are like, that's, the, that's so hard. I finally got on the shelf. Yay. And then, yeah, they have like, you know, I'll give them a day like, yay, celebrate. And then now we have the hard work, the even harder work of getting off the shelf so I love to use um, Rachel Walker as an example. She's a former Whole Foods. Oh my gosh, what a rock star. <laughs> crushing it. Former Whole Foods colleague, employee um, that we both worked with. And then she started her own kombucha company. So from your perspective, how is Rachel doing a great job really helping the, the store and being a great partner and helping her product move? I mean, Rachel is um, doing a lot of things right, and she's also putting in the sweat equity, if you will. She hand delivers. She checks the status of her product. She um, touches her product when she's here. She doesn't just drop off at the back door and then walk out. She goes to the shelf. She looks at her product. She makes sure it's rotated. So she offers that extra helping hands that the departments need um, and makes sure her products look great. She um, interacts with social. So every time she makes a delivery or uh, many times, if not every time, she makes sure the whole set, not just her product, but the four foot section it's in looks great. Puts it on social so that the store looks good. Her product looks good. Um, She, you know, shows endless enthusiasm for um, her product in each and every store she's in. So if you look at her social media, you know, when you work at Lucky's, you feel like, she loves Lucky's Best, but you look and she loves Vitamin Cottage and she loves Beaver's Market and she loves the tap room she's in. And so her love and and making each retailer feel special is something that she's also doing. I know that she also, um, you know, she'll throw a t-shirt at a team member and, and having people show their local pride. And um, so some of that swag too is just some little it has nothing to do with the product but it has to do with building an affinity for the person for the brand um she'll give away you know six kombuchas when she's here to random people and the next time she's here she'll give away three kombuchas to other people so you know it's it's that intermittent reinforcement so you know not everybody gets a free kombucha every visit but someone gets a free kombucha usually and different flavors get a chance out there so All those things aren't just helping her product jump off the shelf. Um, It's a combination of those things that really Mm -hmm. creates the culture where people then, if, you know, a customer is in front of that kombucha set and we can say, oh, check out all these local kombuchas. Um, I had this one yesterday and it was delicious, you know, so team members can actually speak about it. Uh, Team member love. That is a really underrated (laughs) area that people overlook, but... It is. People take care of your line when they take care of, like when they feel cared for, they care for you back. And, and just, 
you know, it's, it's somewhat, all those relationships are really important. And, you know, if you're a, a, a jerk in the world and um, you're making a product and that jerkiness shows up in your product somehow. And I don't know how to describe it as much as uh, it's like biodynamic farming. You know, you can't cry and harvest roses. It's not going to, it's going to make sad rose oil and we <laughs> don't want to do that. So <laughs> we want happy people working with happy products and, Rachel embodies that. Um, she celebrates her staff and her team. She celebrates the team she works with. Um, she always gives love to, and she works in retail. So I think, yeah. um, again, her experience in retail has really helped guide her success as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Oh, so fun. It's fun to give her a shout out on this. And user is a great example. I wish people could just like go like go follow her see what she's doing on social but also follow what what we're just talking about here as much as possible i realize not everybody's doing you know me may not live in the place or as you grow you can't always do that but that's also what the next level of growth with brokers or salespeople mm-hmm. is for as well to help you continue that touch point even as you get larger yeah yeah, so good. So what happens when a product doesn't move? Like, I think that there's a bad, you know, we just talked about what Rachel does. The opposite of that is, great, I got into the store, set it and forget it. Like, it's just going to sell magically. <laughs> so what happens? How do you guys, what do you do at that point when you're, you know, you bring in a product and uh, nothing really happens? Well, it's usually a natural, it's like a bad relationship, right? It's hopefully a natural um, parting of ways. Um, You know, it's it's sad, but it's a real reality that not every small business will make it. And so Mm -hmm. COVID has, of course, put extra challenges on some of our small favorites. Um, I think we had a local pickle brand that um, you know, can't keep up the price of jars has gone through the roof. So their raw materials has gotten to a point where it's not, you know, they, they couldn't maintain their business and had to pull out. So, um, you know, there's some natural progressions like that, but there's sometimes where the person still thinks they have the best product, but it's not selling. So again, we can have a conversation about um, doing demos, seeing if they can come in and, and talk about their product. Um, there's ways to try to jumpstart the life back into that product, um, doing, you know, giving coupons while they're here or putting coupons on the product, trying to give customers an extra incentive to choose that product. Um, and then sometimes it's just, like I said, a mutual parting of ways. Like if a product's not selling, if it goes out of date, you know, well, it's, it's out of date. Like it, 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 we won't reorder it if we can't sell, you know, a case of something before it's out of date. So, right. Um, there's a lot of different ways products die on the shelf, but the food museum, if we have to dust it and date check it, it's, um, it's, it's out of here. And if the, you know, vendor hasn't looked at it, if that, if that, you know, person who has so much passion to get it on the shelf, hasn't taken the time or doesn't have the energy or love or resources to check the status of it in the stores where they are, just to ask the buyer to check the status of it. Um, then we figure it's it's not uh, it's not really their pride and joy, so it's usually mutual. Yeah, and so you just don't reorder, and then and so that's kind of how that ends. I mean, you guys don't have a formal. Yeah. As much, as, the nice thing is you don't have as formal of a process as some other stores with category reviews, and then they bring you in for a period of time, and then they're checking your velocity. I mean, you guys just you can bring things in easily, mm-hmm. but we you just want to sell it. <laughs> it's there to be sold and you as the vendor need to do everything to be a great partner. I always say like, especially those first, you know, 10 accounts, like go deep with them, like give them all the love. Uh, Rachel is a great example, but I think that there's a, a tendency to be like, let me just get as many as possible. And it's all just about getting on the shelf. But I say, go deep with your, your initial stores, like be a really good partner. Yeah, it's like if you can get into a variety of different markets and and to go back to Rachel as an example, you know, she has um, her product on tap so she can hit a tap room or a restaurant. She has her product in bottles so she can hit a, you know, a small store, a big store or a a Fort Collins store and a Boulder store and see where her product's getting set, how it's moving and which set. And then you start to, you know, 
like you said, if you go deep on the relationship side and checking in and touching the product and looking at it in natural habitat in the store, you start to see what really works for your items or what's not working for your items. And then as you start to add to your catalog, you can um, know if there's flavors that aren't moving, if there's brands that do better than yours, if it's placement, um, what what's creating better success for you. And then as you approach other stores, you have that in your tool belt. So when you try to get in a lot of places at once and you're not in a good placement or you don't have the best flavor profiles or you aren't as competitive, you fail at all those stores at once instead of having this like, you know, compartmentalized, well, these two stores are successes and this one's a failure and this is why I think it's a failure. So I'm going to take that knowledge and apply it to my fourth store, my fifth store, my sixth store. So I agree with you. I think it's better to go deep and go slow than to go big and wide all at once. Um, I've seen some companies go big and wide really fast and it's, super fun and high energy, but I've also seen um, a lot of those people um, crash uh, because once uh, a plug gets pulled, it gets pulled really, you know, and they've, they've, you know, they have 20 grand or something in, in these stores in this region. And then all of a sudden, boom, that, that they have no income. So I think yeah. it's better to grow slow and deliberately. Oh, so good. That is great advice and great wisdom because you do, you need that data story to keep growing. And so why not spend the extra time and energy really bolstering your sales? And like, I know, you know, a lot of times when you're a brand new product, depending on where it is on the shelf, like you might be on the very bottom shelf. And so it's going to be harder to move it. I know Rachel in the very early days, you know, had a couple of flavors on bottom shelf and she kept, mm -hmm. you know, you saw the value in it. It's like, okay, yeah, more flavors put you on the top shelf, like you're taking care of your product. So that's another reason it only helps your sales continue to grow. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just hard again for people who don't speak retail language, who don't have a retail background. Um, you have to learn that language to be able to um, talk wisely with your buyers and to have uh, conversations and to understand the lingo that they're using or what they're asking of you or what questions they have. And if you don't speak the language, um, there's that communication barrier. So um, sometimes it just takes those first few stores and those first few forays to, 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 you know, to learn the language in the new country that you're in, which is this grocery store world versus the farmer's market one-on-one -on -one world, which is right. I get to tell everybody one-on-one -on -one how great my stuff is. And it's, it's different when you're, when you're on a grocery store level. Yeah. I actually just talked with Rob Allen. Um, you remember him from oh, yeah. re uh, uh -huh, regional from culinary. Yeah. And, uh, we just had a podcast actually it comes out today, um, on the day we're interviewing, but, um, he was talking about, you know, I feel like this industry has more acronyms than, or as many as the government, right? Oh. Like, you really do need to know it this does. stuff. Yeah. So funny. I mean, I still find myself like having to Google some acronyms sometimes that I'll see. Uh, it could even be from a USDA report or something, you know, I'll be yeah. like, oh my gosh, what is this? Like, I, I, and, and if you're not curious, um, it's easy to just over like speed read over acronyms or like let someone talk to you and you nod your head and then all of a sudden you get out to your car. You're like, what did they what just is? say to me? So I can imagine how those uh, new newbies feel when they come into the industry. You're like, they, you know, smile and nod and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. And they get your car and decompress and take a breath and be like, I have no idea what just happened. Like, yeah. I literally scary, so. I have a whole video that's just like, here's all the acronyms, like here's all the words you're going to hear and explain, try to give people a mm -hmm. crash course. Cause it's like, what's a TPR? <laughs> what's an OI? What's a scan back? What's... <laughs> right. What are they asking? Oh my God. This goes on and on. <laughs> yeah. I love it. There's a whole language for sure in the retail industry, especially grocery. Well, and each company has a unique acronym thing, whether right. even, you know, when you talked about our introduction, it was like, what are you called at Lucky's? Like, what's your position called? What a, you know, if you ask for a specialist at one store, you get a whole different um, person mm -hmm. than if you ask for a specialist at another store. So every company right. has their own unique set of um, titles and acronyms as well, which ha you have to just learn the language of each place. So if you go deep in a few, then you're ready. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So... 
where do you see, like, I mean, I know you can only speak to your position and your store, but what are you kind of seeing as like trends for local and just in the grocery industry as a whole? I mean, we're, we're now two years into the pandemic. We're sort of at the endemic as many people are calling it, right? It's around, it's here to stay. So what are some of your insights or where do you see it going, especially for, from a local producer, producer perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think the local trends haven't, um, I, I think they're still on point. There's room in every category for local. I can't imagine to tell anyone to shy away from a certain category. There's room for growth in every category um, uh, that's competitive. Um, of course, functional foods, they're always, um, sometimes those, what foods those are change, but functional foods, people um, eating for purpose is always a category that is fun to make a splash in because those consumers who are who care about what they're putting in their body um, are, are, you know, like the um, extra information on the label, they'll pay a higher price. So um, functional foods are great. And that shows up in beverage categories. It shows up in, um, you know, bars and granolas. It shows up in, um, Ice cream, you know, even pet and, food and yeah. frozen food, ice cream. Yeah, you name it. Um, CBD is still hot. I don't see CBD going away anytime soon. And um, that's another functional um, functional food category. Um, ethnic foods, uh, we always have such great, um, whether it's local, um, you know, family recipe sauces like Sister's Kitchens or um, hot sauce category is one that people just love to kick around in. Like it is already a huge category. So you have to have good product, but right. salsas and hot sauce is just always a, a, a place that we see lots of um, people entering the market. Um, and then there's, you know, so a, a lot of people don't think about produce, but produce is a, such an awesome entrance. If you're a farmer and you have local product, um, I, it's a great, it, you know, Lucky's has been an awesome place to have local product on the shelf for homegrown, whether it's seeds, starts, um, actual farm raised product. But, um, you know, I see a lot more packaged goods. We talk to a little more packaged goods providers than we do farmers, but the farmers that we work with are awesome. Love them. Yeah. Yeah. And how are you seeing, um, uh, especially small producers, but I guess producer, I mean, all, all brands are having to deal with supply chain issues. You mentioned the pickle company with, you know, the increase in, in, um, their packaging costs. Like, how are you guys managing um, and what do you suggest to people as they're trying to negotiate and manage these price increases, which we're all, we're seeing them across the board, but how, what, what yeah, advice do you have around I mean, that? I think we're, uh, humanity is right now in a crunchy place with pricing, whether it's the cost of housing, cost of your groceries, um, costs are through the roof right now for a lot of things that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, you know, cans and jars and bottles, uh, everything from, if we go back to the beet burger, like the packaging for that beet burger, um, you know, it could be a dollar extra to get the right packaging on that product. And yeah. so um, it's something to consider. Uh, I think that uh, right now prices are very volatile. And they're up and down, we're mostly up, um, depending on the day. So I think, uh, again, advice for a new business operator would be know your terms. I know, you know, Lucky's and um, I know Whole Foods, when I was there, where you require a 30 or a 60 day notification off price increases. So you're going to be sitting on your old costs for a month or two months, even though you have a raw ingredient um, increase. So just, you know, sometimes. Again, just know what your inventory level is so that you know when you need to make those calls and um, hopefully you have enough back stock to hold you through a price increase on your cost of goods so that if your jars or bottles go up, you, you can make it through that 30 or 60 day window. Um, but it is, it's just knowing what your notification should be. And then, you know, we're all in a business where it's the reality is you're going to get that phone call that says, Hey, or that email says our prices are going to go up. 
and here's, you know, 30 days from today, here's the information, here's our new cost. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's hard not to be apologetic about it, especially to the consumers, but it's industry wide and it's um, in every category. I mean, meat right. prices are crazy. Um, dairy prices are crazy. Um, yeah. And then when you look at packaging prices, packaging um, is through higher than I've ever seen. Yeah, that's always one thing that people are shocked by when we actually do their cost of goods sold correctly. And they're like, my packaging is like sometimes as much as the ingredients. I'm like, yep, that's <laughs> yeah, welcome I mean, to packaged food. Oats in a, yeah, oats in a container, um, that container is going to cost as much as the oats. So yeah. you got to you gotta watch it. Um, and it's something to consider. And uh, that's, again, just uh, uh, what you're expertise is, is walking people through all those steps of consideration because the enthusiasm for making food and this is um it takes a, a strength of character to take that enthusiasm and retail that food versus right. uh, just creating it and sharing it because yeah. uh, selling it is different than creating and sharing yeah being the entrepreneur being the business owner versus being the maker yeah yeah. Yeah. There was an article that just came out today from Specialty Food Association talking about price increases and like special, like they did a survey of all of their members and people are definitely starting to look at that second or even third round of price increases. But I think it's important that you do have a strategy and you're not just like willy nilly, mm-hmm. like maybe the price goes up now, right? Like you need a, you need to be looking at your, their whole forecast and doing your cash flow and putting on the business hat and not just you know, yep. there's one price increase. Like how long can you absorb that before it's absolutely necessary? Because it is going to affect potentially your product selling on the shelf, right? And I mean, we, as the producer, the brand still need to make money, but also the grocery store still needs to make money. Like, and unfortunately the consumer yeah. is the ones are bearing the brunt of it, but we're all in that position because we all eat. <laughs> totally. Well, and I know a strategy that uh, companies big and small adopt is like, okay, well, I won't increase my price, but I'm going to go from a, you know, a 25 ounce dish soap to a 19 ounce mm-hmm. dish soap. And um, I might, I can even probably use the same jar, just going to have a little bit, bit yeah. bigger gap on top. Yeah. So um, there's, there's different ways to approach those price yeah. increases as well. Um, sometimes they don't have to be retail increases. They might just be package size changes. We've seen it, like I said, with dish soap, it's coffee, it's granola, it's, it's uh, so a true. lot of different size changes, um, or they'll change um, a case size. So instead of it being maybe 12 per case, you get six per case um, so that there's less commitment from the, the store to buy a, he- a bigger amount to see if it's going to be okay, yeah. um, which is less about cost, but more about like unit movement and like, how do I, you know, is my package too big or too small? Yeah. It gives you more flexibility. I, you mentioned that earlier and I was going to mention, yeah, kind of reiterate that, that like, I'm big, I'm a big fan of smaller case cops, case pack sizes, right? Six or eight, something Mm -hmm. like that, because especially if it's a product that's going to go out of date, but grocery stores don't like to carry a lot of back stock. If any, they want it to all go on the shelf. I always tell people like, Literally yeah. take your packaging and go see if how it fits on the shelf and how many you can get on there. Um, I don't know if you remember, I've used this example before, but when I was at Whole Foods, I think I showed it to you. There was a woman that came in with these giant, um, they're beautiful, like glass jars of like household cleaners. <laughs> and she was like wanting to get on Whole food shelves. And somehow I ended up talking to her and, and I was like, they're beautiful, <laughs> but like they don't fit literally fit on the shelf in the category that they need to go <laughs> unless it's on the very top shelf uh, and then it's glass so we don't want we don't yeah. put glass <laughs> top shelf you got shorties like me trying to reach a glass <laughs> bottle full of heavy liquid on the top shelf You're like nope not right. gonna fly so sometimes our oh, yeah that's a sad story <laughs> I still have them actually. They were beautiful. I was like, oh, these are great. But yeah, no, they're not going to. That's awesome. We got to rethink our packaging. Sometimes our innovative packaging is not always going to work. Like you said, it needs to stand up on a shelf. It needs to be displayed. I know. I've seen some gorgeous cracker packages, like you said, that are, you know, it's like a when you take a sheet of crackers and, you know, it's a big 
big chunk of crackers on a tall, tall, beautiful window bag, but you're like, okay, where are you going to put it that it doesn't get beat to shreds? I mean, again, if you're carrying it from your car to your table, you can be really cautious, but if you're getting into a grocery store, man, it's down and dirty in here. We're swinging things around. So yeah, well, I love it. we, we try to treat things with care, but, um, it's that you gotta sh- get that shipping. I mean, unless <laughs> you are the brand and you are like carefully delivering it and putting it on the shelf, mm-hmm. like, it's not, pro- that's the only way it's going to work. And even then your yeah. customers are going to get at home and what's their experience as well. Like what? What shelf is that big old cracker bag going to end up on? <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Um, oh, I, the question I always get, um, and I have my answer to it, but I'm curious where you would put the range of what are the margins that grocery stores, like a grocery store of your size need to have when they bring in a product. So I always tell people, let's see if you agree with me, minimum of 35%, um, up to 50 is where the range is. Yeah, I'd say you're about right. And for most grocery stores, it's by category. Right. So I would say, you know, on body care is usually a different range than, um, you know, dairy. And so it's like depends on what the item is. And so trying to find out that range about the kind of product, if you have a, you know, body lotion versus, um, you know, a kombucha, uh, there are going to be different margins for those categories. And also what um, some you know, again, small business might not be thinking about is um, there's a certain amount of shrink that a grocery store expects as well through breakage, through things that go out of date, through um, customers dropping one on the floor, a team member dropping one on the floor. Um, staff, and giving them away you know, sometimes, shrink. right? Like that, that yeah, sample, totally. right? Like it's on us kind of right. programs. So, yeah. We try to build shrink into a margin as well. Um, I know uh, companies like Whole Foods do granular shrink, um, and so it's tracked on a separate line. And uh, a lot smaller grocery stores, a lot of times, will just have it uh, built into a margin target. Mm, so good. And if you don't know what shrink is, go. <laughs> I have a module on. That. <laughs> it's just it's your waste. Oh, good. Do you really? So, well, I have like like I oh, said, yeah, the overall, so many all the terms you need to know, right? Shrink. What is that? I mean, it makes sense, right? It's the waste, but I, I love, love it. it. Yeah. What is purge? You know, you got to <laughs> consider like, what is purge if you got a fresh product? So yeah. um, you got it. That's awesome. Yeah, I love it. Oh my gosh. So good. I feel like I could just talk about stuff with you all day, but I would love to hear, love as, I, as I mentioned, um, I know these are all a lot. Thank you so much. These are such great answers and wisdom and insight for people. Um, I feel like I, I sometimes beat a dead horse, but when they hear it from other people's mouths and <laughs> like yourself, <laughs> they, they somehow believe me more. Yeah. And so. we didn't plan this. So that's awesome. We're, we're on the we same page. Not, we did not. Um, but I would love to just actually shift gears a little bit and talk about you, some of your leadership qualities that you what has gotten you to this level? As I mentioned earlier, I, I really do look at you as just a shining, an amazing example. I'm going to get a little emotional, but like you were such a mentor yeah. to me at Whole Foods and that time. And I learned so much from you and so many lessons that I take with me today. Um, you gave me some hard feedback and hard truths, but um, they made me a better person. And I just think you have like this amazing calm under fire and ability to to be flexible. You embrace the term of like, it is what it is. Now let's just start solving problems. So how did you get this way? What do you, because we need this as entrepreneurs. <laughs> so <laughs> teach us, how do you do yeah, this? Yeah, I'm not sure. You, I'm not sure how I ended up this way, but um, I think, you know, I've always been a person who values honesty and transparency. Um, elitism is my nemesis. So when I see people who think that because of their role or because of their, um, you know, title or whatever, that they, they should have more entitlements and less to do. So I think just, um, doing work with people, um, really makes you have compassion for the job and the people doing it. Um, also, just again, starting each day fresh. I know here, you know, at Lucky's, one thing that's really important to me is that we 
understand that we're all working for the same thing. So if you think someone did something because they're trying to make your day worse, uh, you got to step back and be like, wait, we, none of us have time to try to uh, you know, make each other have harder lives. Right. So just step back from a point of positivity and, and understand that we're all working for the same thing and that we want to make each other, push each other to be the best that we can be. So honesty and transparency, I think, is the best avenue for that. Um, and talking to people directly, I think a conversation can go a long way versus uh, an email sometimes can, you can't read that person's body. You can't see into their eyes and see the human on the other side of, uh, of a note. So, you know, talk to the people that you work with, talk to people you have problems with, or talk to people who you see who could be better and also talk to people who are doing a great job and tell them. So, mm, uh, celebrate each day and let, let each day unfold. Uh, each day is going to unfold naturally and just make sure the people around you have a sense of humor because, um, Again, if you're bringing anger to the workplace, how you're, you just leave a wake. Um, and I, I think I've seen and worked with people who leave a big wake behind them and they just don't understand what it feels like to be caught up in that wake where your, your boat gets rocked um, because the big yacht went by. And that's not the person I know I wanted to be. So when I saw that happening, I just made sure that I try to be conscientious we all leave awake but what, what's happening behind you in your wake and what are the people are you leaving a gentle wake are you bringing people with you or are you rocking people's boats and then walking off so yeah um I yeah think you were I don't know how it gets to be that way I, I think you were such a great example of like you got in there like you're not like you do the work I mean when I go into Lucky's you're you're unloading pallets you're stocking shelves like you're helping customers and you still have your duties as a leader and as a, as a store director. I mean, you have a lot on your plate, but you're not just hanging out in the office and just like, you know, good luck everyone. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you noticed. I think uh, team members noticed that too. I think that I have a reputation from all the stores I worked at of being someone who um, isn't afraid to do the work. And again, I'll go back to that entitlement piece. Like, if you don't know how to do the jobs in your building, then I, I understand that you shouldn't be the one doing them every day, but you should still understand how the, you know, all the jobs work and um, not think you're better than or that you um, shouldn't be doing those things. I think it's a blast to be able to um, go from one department to another and see what needs to happen and help get them ahead and then, you know, split off to the next department. I have a hummingbird style. So I tend to dip and dive throughout the store throughout the day. Yeah. So good. Well, thank you, Tanya. I really appreciate your time. I know you're in the middle of your work day and um, this yeah. has been a really, really amazing um, conversation and it's going to be so helpful for people. So thank you for your time today. Well, thanks for the invitation. And again, Sarah, I'm so proud of what you have uh, turned your career into. You've done an awesome job since uh, we worked together at Whole Foods and um, great. Uh, you're just such a great resource for uh, up upcoming new products. And um, I'm proud of you. So thanks again for including me in your podcast. I feel really blessed. That is so nice of you to say, and it has been my absolute pleasure to have you here. I know people are getting so much out of this. Um, and if you guys want to check out Lucky's Market, they're on all the social media. They're based in uh, Boulder, Colorado, and they have a store in Fort Collins. Uh, but this insight into what it takes to get onto grocery store shelves and stay there has just been phenomenal. Um, so helpful for everyone listening. And I couldn't have said it better myself about the services and how I try to help people than what Tanya said. So I'm just going to leave it there. Until next time, have an amazing week. Are you ready to start that delicious idea that you make in your home kitchen or grow your existing packaged food business and take it to the next level? The most successful food business entrepreneurs have support, guidance, focus, and accountability to help them make it happen quickly without wasting time or money. Plus, I think starting your packaged food business should actually be fun. Food business success is your secret ingredient to creating your food business dream. 
please don't go this alone. Check out the private free Food Business Success Facebook group to connect with other foodpreneurs, get your questions answered quickly, share your wins, and receive special training and tools I only share inside the private community. Just search for Food Business Success on Facebook or get the link in the show notes. Curious about how Food Business Success can help you? Head over to foodbizsuccess.com and fill out the application to see if you're a great fit for the program. Together, let's make your food business dream a reality.